Financial crises. We all love hearing about how screwed all of us are going to be. What's even better is hearing about the silly mistakes made in the past that helped modern nations take economic baby steps to prevent such disasters. From Mansa Musa wrecking local economies to the Great Depression causing a bunch of people to be very, very sad. But while we're all familiar with the Great Depression and the 2008 housing bubble and we all have a good rough idea of what exactly happened to cause these recessions, there is another recession that doesn't really get a lot of focus. The dot-com bubble. And even though a lot of people have heard this term, many, including me, didn't fully know what it was or what exactly happened. You know, what do you mean the internet had a recession? Well, the internet was just like any other new industry. Some new, world-changing, revolutionary technology came onto the scene, people got very interested in it, they saw the money-making potential, and they wanted to get involved. But, again, like with any other industry, there is such a thing as overinvestment. Overinvestment inflates the prices in the industry, making everything more expensive, which only drives the prices even higher and higher. But when it turns out that all of this investment isn't actually generating any profit, well, you get the dot-com bubble. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome, top shelf goods from under the radar brands that is free to join and can provide you with top of the range products with a huge amount of variety. From delicious Mexican chocolate, some of the best you'll ever eat in your entire life, or amazing equipment for the kitchen. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US, such as Forge, which is a Damascus steel knife made by Buck and Bear Knives, which is located in Pennsylvania, or Carnivore, which has an American barbecue rub in the box and is made by the Great American Spice Company in Rockford, Michigan. It's all about supporting small brands, which is the heartbeat of Bespoke Post. It's why they've spent more than $140 million supporting small businesses over for the past decade. Every box of awesome offered has around $70 worth of goods inside, but only costs you a fraction of the value. Every month, Bespoke Post introduces their members to cool new products from outdoor gear, barware, homeware, kitchen goods, clothing, and much, much more. Even live oysters. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that, but I mean if you do, you know, you might be a chef or something, then hey, go nuts. But Bespoke Post has a short 10 step quiz to help fine tune which boxes would be perfect for you, so that you will receive useful and unique items that fit your preferences from the start. Before you receive a box, you can actually preview it before it's shipped. You will get a box of awesome assigned to you every month, and before it's shipped, you'll actually get a preview of what comes inside, so that you can decide if you would like to keep it, or swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely at no charge. You will only pay for what you want. Since the box lineup changes every month, you will find plenty of things to choose from. A few of the boxes that I've had my eye on are the Terra Box, which comes with a field knife, a detox scrub bar, and Audubon bird call, the Explore Box, which comes with a Cola Tree packable backpack, a 25 ounce M8 water bottle from Mizu, a survival LED headlamp by Off Grid Tools, and a toasted coconut and vanilla bean bar by Tows Bakes, and the Weekender Box, which contains a bag made of durable cotton canvas with a metal reinforced frame, thick leather handles, and an interior pocket which fits up to a 15 inch slim or 13 inch bulkier laptop. So to get 20% off of your first box of awesome, click my link down in the description and enter code DANKILA20 at the checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash DANKILA20. Thank you Bespoke Post very much for sponsoring this video, show them some love, click the link. So what exactly was the dot com bubble? 
Well, for that, we will have to go back in time to the 90s, the time of techno, wild hackers on the loose, and of course, the beginnings of the internet. The economy was booming, things were going good, and the tech-filled future looked prosperous, both for the individual and, of course, the corporations. Now, I'm not going to school you on economics or the societal impact of new technology, but we'll have a brief look over it. Many different technologies have affected our way of life, which can change how economies and companies function. For example, once mankind figured out how to pull oil out of the ground, the whaling industry, which was worth millions and millions, completely died overnight, because we didn't need whale oil anymore. This is just the nature of how markets evolve. People work on new technology that is a lot more efficient and replaces more archaic forms of machinery, from mechanical looms replacing ye olde women-driven looms to horses being replaced by automobiles. There are tons and tons of examples, and with each of these examples, in particular the technologies invented after the Industrial Revolution, they have had a much wider grand effect on our societies. This is an ongoing double-edged sword, because when a machine is invented that can do the work of 20 men, 20 men have just lost their jobs. Job losses to technology will constantly be an issue for us. I mean, a perfect example would be the concern of AI automation. Besides the commonly discussed ethical and moral aspect of Skynet nuking the entire world, a big concern is AI replacing many human-driven jobs, but that's a topic for another time. So, with these technologies in mind, the one that I personally feel has had the most massive impact on our society is the internet. Of course, computers themselves were very impactful, but it wasn't until we started connecting them together and exchanging information all over the world that the social impact went through the roof. Now, we all love a new idea to jump onto, and the internet would be the golden ball pit of American venture capitalists. But when you combine technology with a ripe economy, things can go a little bit too far. So, we've discussed the technology, but what about the economy? So, let's take a look at how the economic situation was in the 90s. I could put this in a very long and complicated video essay style explanation of the economy in the 90s, but the best way to describe it can be summed up in very few words. Afredo was only 10p. The Yanks won't understand this, but in Britain, the price of a Freddo is genuinely used as a measure of inflation and how well the economy is doing. It's called the Freddo Index, and it's a very real thing. But, confectionery aside, the economy was doing well. Kind of. The start of the 1990s had a little bit of a recession, and the government wanted further economic growth, which would lead to a few policies being put in place in order to help out. This would include, most notably, the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997, which lowered the top capital gains tax rate. This, combined with low interest rates, meant that people had more leftover capital that they could use to invest. But, what to invest in? Well, although the internet existed in the early 1990s, there was barely anyone on it. And it generally wasn't very user-friendly. You needed a lot more computer skills back then compared to now, where computer usage has been very dumbed down compared to what it was in the past. But this would all change with the rollout of a new internet browser by the name of Mosaic. Being one of the first widely available browsers, it became the superstar of the computing world. But this revolution of a brand new browser that was more user-friendly and incorporated more imagery made the internet much, much easier to use for average everyday people. Meaning a lot more people were now starting to use the internet. Before the release of Mosaic, the website count around the world was in the tens. Give it another year, and in 1993, with the release of Mosaic, the number was now in the hundreds. Then, another year in the thousands, etc, etc. The internet was growing very fast, and millions of new internet users meant millions of potential customers for online businesses. Investors, of course, understood this, so just like the gold rush back in the day, everyone grabbed their pans and ran for the river. 
The growth of the internet and its general popularity, of course, started snowballing. Computers became more accessible, the internet became more accessible, more websites were being made and more companies alongside them. Plus, unlike a local shop where its customer base was only whoever lived in the town that the shop was located, with the internet your customer base could be the entire internet. Millions and millions of people. So, as you can imagine, plenty of internet-based companies within the IT sector started to expand very quickly, with the internet being a lot more accommodating for both users and website owners. Everything a person could ever want was at the tip of their fingers. Every urge, every human desire. You want funny cat pictures, you want pictures of something that's another word for cat, you name it, you could have it, there was plenty of it. The internet was the virtual frontier, primed and ready to be claimed. So, of course, it wouldn't take long for Silicon Valley to get its hands on it and fill it with shit. You have to think of the time that people were living in. I remember those days pretty well myself, but I'm sure plenty of you can't imagine a world without contactless pay, TikTok and skibbity toilet. But yes, the internet wasn't being used to its full potential, especially in terms of cash. There was a lot of information on there, but there weren't a lot of shops offering products or services. Bear in mind, this was long before the days of Amazon, eBay and Etsy. Of course, there are clear big dogs when it comes to modern online shops, but in the 90s, it was the Wild West, baby, and everyone was fighting for a piece of that pie. So, investors started joining in and absolutely pumping shit tons of money into these new e-companies. Surely, these investments will pay off. This is the new age and everyone is going to be using all of these websites forever. Well, some of them maybe, but we'll get to that in a moment. But things were changing very fast, so remember Mosaic, the groundbreaking browser that had set the standard for web searches? Poof, gone, it was dead. There was now a new king in town, and that was Netscape Navigator. This new browser coming out in late 1994 would overtake Mosaic with it being even more user-friendly and working a lot better with displaying images on the fly. You can see why things were growing so fast. There were so many different factors on so many different levels, with technology constantly evolving and getting better both physically and virtually. As for Netscape Navigator, this would pair perfectly with the release of Windows 95, yet again another application that would evolve the home computer environment by being very easy and approachable for new computer users with it having a very simple graphical user interface instead of it being command line. With this rise in popularity, Netscape would become one of the default applications that everyone would use. So, why all this focus on Netscape Navigator in a video that's supposed to be about a recession? Well, Netscape Navigator would become one of the defining landmarks of the dot-com bubble because they kind of started it. Not for their early prowess in the first browser war, but instead for their decision to take the company public just a year after it had been formed. The initial stock price was to be set at $14 per share, but they made a last minute decision to double the price. On the very first day of trading, their shares value would shoot up to $75 and would close at roughly $58, earning them a market value of $2.9 billion in just a single day. So, as you can imagine, plenty of other internet companies saw Netscape Navigator, a browser of all things, just make $3 billion in a single day. So, they all decided to do the exact same thing and take all of their companies public. And, since the internet was the next big thing, tons of investors started investing tons of money in all of these companies who were going public. So, Netscape Navigator are kind of responsible for starting the huge investment rush into the internet. 
But remember how I said that things change fast? Well, for better or for worse, Netscape Navigator was very quickly heading to its deathbed. Although Netscape Navigator paired very well with Windows 95, Microsoft came up with the perfect game plan. How about we just develop our own browser and bundle it for free with our very popular operating system? So, just a few weeks after Netscape Navigator went public, Internet Explorer came on the scene. So to fully understand why this new booming industry went completely to shit, let's have a little lesson in economics. Communists and socialists, please pay attention. Let's say I want to sell some apples. I would look into the costs of running an orchard, staff, machinery, logistics, etc, etc, because all of that knowledge is readily available because the apple industry is already a very established thing with a very, very long history of information that I can draw from. And then I would decide a price for each apple that would cover the cost it took me to produce the apple, but still nets me some profit. The apple industry, which, let's face it, has existed since civilization first found apples in the wild, is very well researched and understood because we've been doing it for so long. People know the dangers of blights, bad harvests, logistical problems, adverse weather, diseases that can destroy the trees, and so on and so on. Because we have a few thousand years of understanding of it because this industry has been around for so long and it has a massive wealth of knowledge that we can draw from. So, people in the Apple industry know how to be prepared for these things and they plan accordingly. All based on years and years of statistical analysis and passed down knowledge of this industry. The internet, however, was completely brand new and had none of that knowledge. Everyone was just winging it. Everyone, this had never been done before. They didn't know the upfront costs and requirements of running these companies since these types of companies didn't even exist until six months ago. All of this information was only just being discovered. Everyone was learning on the job. And they didn't know how to prepare for what might go wrong since they didn't know what could go wrong because they hadn't been around long enough for anything to go wrong. Also, there was really not much knowledge of when was a good time to invest or how much they should invest or whether an internet investment would even go places because the internet hadn't been around long enough for investors to properly map it out. They were just throwing money in every direction at every internet company. There wasn't decades of statistical or market analysis, there was only speculation. And speculation without information is called a guess. And when it comes to investing, a guess uh, is not a good place to start. And one of the biggest contributors to the dot-com bubble was that everyone was just guessing. They were just throwing money in random directions and hoping for the best. So you had a bunch of these tech startups that may have only had a small number of employees and due to the nature of a lot of web-based companies back then, the running costs were pretty minor compared to other companies. And this web company would get a bunch of money thrown at it by investors. These companies then went, ooh, money! and started splurging the investment cash on marketing to attract more investment money, when instead they should have been using the initial investment money to actually grow their company and their profits so that these investments would actually see a return. You know how the old saying goes, you got to spend money to make money? Well, technically they were, but in a way that essentially, although accidentally, turned the entire internet into a giant Ponzi scheme. The banking industry at the time and various company representatives, instead of seeing the writing on the wall, were actually reassuring investors, saying, yeah, there's a bunch of losses right now, but that won't matter much since there would always be bigger profits later on. Basically, their whole pitch was, hey guys, come on, this is the internet we're talking about. There is absolutely no chance we could lose money. So don't worry about the short-term goals. Think of the long-term stonks. If we keep throwing money at it, eventually, number will go up. From 1998 to the year 2000, the bubble would really grow. But the time was coming. Y2K. Fuck it. Fucking remember Y2K. Well, most of you Zoomers won't, but I'm sure you've at least heard of it. 
Well, just as the 90s were closing in on the millennium, there was a small issue with computers at the time that could potentially wipe out a lot of computing infrastructure. I'm not going to go too deep into the details, since you can all just go and look it up yourself, but the issue was a bug surrounding the way that calendars worked on computers, since the year 2000 wouldn't actually be recognised properly on machines, which would cause internal system errors. Basically, old computer software was apparently not built to recognise the year 2000. No like big number, computing no likey, computing stoppy worky. This had already taken effect in many other programmes at the time, especially programmes made to predict certain values ahead of time that went past the year 1999. But before things went to shit when the big double O hit, people of course scrambled to get this bug fixed, leading to a wave of computer and software upgrades, again further boosting the market and all of the hype around various companies and attracting even more investment money. Y2K, I can remember Y2K being in the news and it was portrayed as the end of the digital world as we knew it and it just turned out to be a giant fucking nothing burger. It was starting to get very, very crazy just how fast these companies would start up and gain fame, with the most popular example being Pets.com. They opened in late 1998 and, as you can imagine, they focused on the distribution of pet-based products. Only a few months later, they managed to get millions of dollars worth of investments with even Amazon themselves purchasing a 54% stake in the company. This money would, of course, be put to good use, and they went really hard on the advertising with their notable mascot, the Dog Sock Puppet. Maybe you think it's adorable, but this face is very widely regarded as one of the four horsemen of the dot-com bubble. This sock puppet became their headliner for their advertising, even gaining a cult following, and I'm sure many of the older Americans watching will remember this fucking sock puppet. The company had even spent $1.2 million on a Super Bowl ad as their first ever national commercial in January of 2000. So, within a year, this company went from being formed to running ads during the Super Bowl. This just shows truly how fast some of these companies were blowing up. I mean, it was getting to the point where companies were just adding .com to their name because it meant they would get investments. It was just getting absolutely out of hand. So, with the internet surviving the Y2K bug, things were looking pretty good for these new age .com companies. The Nasdaq Composite Index would eventually peak on March the 10th, 2000, rising 800% from 1995 which is just sheer exponential growth, which of course only attracted more investors. So, with such nuclear growth being based only on new investments and not on actual profits being generated by the services that these internet companies offered, the bubble went pop. It's Pretty hard to say exactly what specifically burst the bubble because many economists have speculated on many factors as to why things went downhill. But one of the main factors was that the US Federal Reserve raised the interest rates several times, meaning that investors were less likely to invest because they didn't have enough capital to invest. So, like pretty much every single other recession, it was government regulation that caused it. But when the investments dried up, shit tons of companies all over the internet kind of realised, holy shit, we actually weren't making any money. We, we weren't making any money whatsoever. We were being held up completely by investors. And when companies aren't making any money, they collapse. And a lot of companies collapsed. Only a few days after the Nasdaq Composite Index had reached an all-time high, Japan entered into another recession, which spread more worries about the current market, scaring many people away from the dot-com hype, and again, towards more stable forms of investment. Then, things completely went to shit, with the market plummeting 740% only two years after its peak. 
This caused an absolute wave of devastation throughout the entire internet, especially to all of these startup companies, because they weren't really sustainable due to their business model of grab investments now, worry about the profits later. It's hard to get a solid number on all of the companies affected during the dot-com bubble, but roughly only 48% of the companies involved in the dot-com bubble would actually survive it. Zoomers won't remember this, but picture over half of all the websites you know and love all over the internet just disappearing. They all shut down. That, that was what happened. Half of the internet just fucking vanished because everyone realised that they weren't making any money. But the companies who did survive, like eBay or Amazon, because while they were taking investments, they were using that money to actually grow the company and generate profits, well, they ended up becoming the absolute powerhouses that are still around today. There were mass layoffs all throughout the industry, with software developers and programmers in general being laid off en masse. Hype around computers and their web offshoots had died off as well, leaving a bit of a bitter taste in everyone's mouths. And let's just say for very, very many years, a lot of investors were very reluctant to invest any more money in anything internet-based. Oh, and uh, Pets.com, if you couldn't already guess, died off as well just two years after being founded. So in the space of two years, they went from being founded to running Super Bowl commercials to being dead in the water. These companies shot up just as fast as they'd be shot down by the bubble bursting. But things obviously got a lot better and the internet is now one of the most profitable places for companies to be. And the lesson that we all learned here is before investing any money into a company, it's probably a good idea to check if that company is actually making money. Don't go anywhere. You sit right there. I've got live shows coming up in London this December and you can buy tickets to them down below and come to see me. I've got a small show at Comedy Unleashed and then I've got two big shows later in the week. You can, you can come to my shows if you buy tickets in the links down below. For the four women who watch this channel, you can buy them as an early Christmas present for your man friend or boy toy or whatever the hell you've got. I don't, I don't know what women do. But still, come, come to my show and I will tell funny jokes and I promise I'll only be a little bit racist. Just a little bit, just a little bit racist. But anyway, come come to my show. I want I want to I want to see you all in person, so I can fight you. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody, subscribe.